Holy Gospel according to Mark, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Again he began to teach beside the lake. Such a very large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat on the lake and sat there, while the whole crowd was beside the lake on the land. He began to teach them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Other seed fell into good soil and brought forth grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirty and sixty and a hundredfold. And he said, Let anyone with ears to hear listen. When he was alone, those who were around him, along with the twelve, asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything comes in parables, in order that they may indeed look but not perceive, and may indeed listen but not understand, so that they may not turn again and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? Then how will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones on the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. When they hear the word, they immediately receive it with joy. But they have no root and endure only for a while. Then when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are those sown among the thorns. These are the ones who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, and it yields nothing. And these are the ones sown on the good soil. They hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, 30 and 60 and a hundredfold. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Let us pray. O oh God, open our ears so that we may hear your voice. Open our minds so that we may receive your wisdom. Open our hearts so that we may know your love and peace. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today is a special day as we celebrate a milestone with some of our youth, First Communion. This month, we're also celebrating the season of creation when we reflect more intentionally on God's good creation and our connection to it, and we give thanks for it. Holy Communion, or the Lord's Supper, or Eucharist, is the focused focus of our first text for today. It's part of a letter written by Paul to the church in Corinth reminding them of the importance of this meal. Paul learned about Holy Communion from others in the church, and over the centuries, this meal has been passed on and on and on, all the way to us today. Most of this brief passage may sound very familiar because it includes the words of institution that we hear every Sunday in preparation for Holy Communion. But even though it may sound familiar, we may not give it much real thought. So while a few here today will soon partake of Holy Communion for the first time, this is an opportunity for all of us to reflect on the meaning and significance of this simple yet profound meal. Holy Communion is a concrete means to connect with God, who wants to be in relationship 
with each one of us. This meal reminds us that Jesus died for us because God loves us. This meal also reminds us of God's good creation, which provides bread and wine so that we can celebrate Holy Communion. As we just heard in the First Communion Milestone Blessing, through this meal we receive God's grace and mercy and forgiveness. This meal changes us and makes us new. I just read a book called Take This Bread by Sarah Miles. It's a spiritual memoir. In it, Sarah explains how she went from being completely skeptical of religion to joining the Episcopal Church, serving as a deacon, and starting a food pantry at her church in San Francisco. It was an entirely unexpected, and as she writes, inconvenient journey. And it all began with Holy Communion. One day, feeling curious, which was typical for Sarah, who was a reporter, she walked into St. Gregory of Nyssa's Episcopal Church to attend a worship service. When she stepped forward for communion, she was suddenly moved to tears. She felt physically unbalanced and confused. She had a hard time understanding or verbalizing what exactly happened to her when she took that bread and wine. But somehow, everything had changed. Sarah continued to attend worship services at St. Gregory's and to take communion. She was soon invited to assist during worship and to help serve communion. She later invited someone else to do these things at St. Gregory's too. That person responded, Oh, I'm not a good enough person to do that. Sarah reassured him he was good enough, but then said, you know, it's not really about you. After being part of St. Gregory's for about a year, Sarah found herself wrestling with an urgent question. Now that you've taken the bread, what are you going to do? A short while later, she came across a standard fundraising letter in the mail from the San Francisco Food Bank. The letter described a new program of neighborhood food pantries they were starting. Anxiously, Sarah called the organization to ask about starting a food pantry at St. Gregory's. In a letter to the congregation explaining why she felt compelled to do this work, she stated, because of how I've been welcomed and fed in the Eucharist, I see starting a food pantry at church not as an act of outreach, but one of gratitude. To feed others means acknowledging our own hunger and at the same time acknowledging the amazing abundance we're fed with by God. After some resistance, within the congregation to the idea of a food pantry at St. Gregory's, and some persistence on Sarah's part, the food pantry began operating once a week, right in the sanctuary, around the altar where Holy Communion was celebrated. Sarah served alongside volunteers she'd recruited and people who were served by the pantry and then volunteered to help there. Sometimes this work was exciting. Many times it was tiring and frustrating. Sometimes Sarah liked the people she worked with. Sometimes she didn't. But through it all, she saw how she and others were being transformed and formed into a community. She saw that they were receiving God's abundant love and sharing it with others. And she recognized this as a glimpse of the kingdom of heaven. We also see a glimpse of the kingdom of heaven, of God's reign, in the parable of the sower. 
Our text tells us that Jesus is teaching a large crowd who has come to hear him. He teaches them many things in parables, including the parable of the sower. In it, the sower goes out to scatter seeds. Some of the seeds fall on a path, and the birds eat them. Other seeds fall on rocky ground. They grow quickly, but then wither when the sun comes out because they have no roots. Other seeds fall among thorns and are choked out by the thorns. Some seeds fall on good soil and grow to be grain, yielding 30, 60, and 100 times what was planted. Later, the disciples and those close to Jesus ask him to explain the parable. Jesus doesn't identify who the sower is, but explains that the seed the sower is planting is the word of God. The word falls on different types of soil, or we might say different people with different priorities, and there are different outcomes. Jesus says that the people who represent the path hear the word, but it is immediately taken away from them by Satan. The people who represent the rocky soil joyfully hear the word, but there is no depth to their faith, and the faith withers when they face difficulties. The people who represent the thorny soil hear the word, but they are focused on other things that come in and choke the word so it can't grow in them. The people who represent the good soil hear the word and accept it, and it grows abundantly. The Message Bible translates the last verse of our gospel reading like this. But the seed planted in the good earth represents those who hear the word, embrace it, and produce a harvest beyond their wildest dreams. Thinking about the parable of the sower makes me wonder what kind of soil I am. I imagine that I've been all of these types of soil at various times in my life. But what kind of soil am I now? What are my priorities? Am I embracing the word? How well is it growing in my life? What am I doing to facilitate its growth? Or even what am I doing that impedes its growth? What else might I do to help the word grow in me beyond my wildest dreams? I'm also intrigued by the actions of the sower, who we might see as representing God. In telling this parable, Jesus says that as the sower was sowing seed, some of it fell on the different types of soil mentioned. But later, when Jesus is explaining the parable to the disciples and others, he uses the word sown when referring to the seed landing on these different types of soil. Is the sower being careless or wasteful? Maybe the sower doesn't know what type of soil these seeds are falling on or being sown on. Maybe the sower is extravagant wanting to offer life abundantly, giving every type of soil an opportunity to produce fruit. Maybe we are also the sower in this parable. We have many opportunities to sow the word. How do we go about it? Do we wait until we're sure the soil is good soil? And what does that look like? Maybe we wait to share the word with those who we're pretty sure will understand it and produce fruit. Are we offering the word abundantly or frugally, according to our perception of people? I recently watched a movie called Jesus Revolution that depicts one of the biggest Christian revivals in the U.S. that began in California in the late 1960s. The basic plot is that a hippie Jesus follower and preacher named Lonnie Frisbee 
meets a pastor of a small traditional church named Chuck Smith. Chuck knows his church is dwindling, that that younger people aren't interested in his church. Chuck can't really relate to Lonnie. Lonnie seems to make Chuck uncomfortable. But Chuck also sees Lonnie's faith and gives him a chance to speak at his church. Lonnie invites other hippies to come and introduces the idea of contemporary music. Chuck goes along with Lonnie's ideas, even though some members of its church leave because they don't like these changes. They don't see hippies as good soil, as people were sharing their faith with. But many more hippies join the church. They feel welcomed and find meaning in learning about and following Jesus. When Chuck and Lonnie have a falling out and Lonnie leaves, Chuck worries that it will all fall apart. But Chuck's wife reminds him that the movement, as they called it then, or the revolution, as an article in Times Magazine later called it, wasn't about Chuck or Lonnie. It was about Jesus. It was about God's great love for all people. And in fact, the movement, the revolution, continued. Chuck and Lonnie, both imperfect people, like all of us, sowed the word, and God made it grow abundantly. God loves us and offers us abundant life in many ways, through Holy Communion, through the Word, through people and experiences that are sometimes unexpected and uncomfortable. And we are called to share this abundant life and God's love with others. I'll close with a prayer from the book, Take This Bread, that reflects this idea of passing on to others what we've received from God. Sarah wrote this prayer to use at the food pantry at St. Gregory's, but it can also speak to us today. O oh God of abundance, you feed us every day. Rise in us now, make us into your bread, that we may share your gifts with a hungry world and join in love with all people. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.